Hi everybody, I'm Chris Spiller and I work for the Bodie Foundation, the cooperating association that helps support Bodie and funnel money into here for vital projects such as stabilization and interpretation, staffing, and a lot of other projects. And I'm sorry you can't be with us here today. Um, we really miss you up here at the park. We hope that you can all come up and see us soon. But for the meantime, we're going to take a little trip through the stamp mill, and hopefully you can go on a real stamp mill soon. Let's get started. What is a stamp mill? Well, it's a place where big iron stamps crushed the ore that came out of the mountains that contained the gold and silver. So it's not like panning for gold. You have to crush the ore down and then separate it from the rock using chemicals, which we'll be talking about. And the early 49ers, they, they just uh, went into the streams and picked up the loose gold. But that loose gold was all picked up pretty quickly. And pretty soon, Californians started saying, well, let's go after the source of that. Let's go into the mountains. And that's when you saw a lot of hard rock mining begin in earnest. And the Cornish stamp mills were an inspiration for the California stamp mills that followed. The Cornish stamp mills had a wooden post and then an iron shoe to do the crushing, but that wasn't quite as stable. The Californians decided to make the entire stamp, all parts of it, completely out of iron. And so that's what you're going to see today. The stamp mill that we have here, um, we think the stamps are about 900 to 1,000 pounds. And uh, we're going to walk through a few areas that uh, we don't normally go on the public tours just because they're very small and hard to get into. So that's going to be a special treat today for you. So we're going to go on up here to the Hoover House if you'd like to follow me up here. Hi, we're standing in front of what we today call the Hoover House. It's named for Theodore Hoover, who was one of the superintendents here. And he got here in mid-1903 and stayed till early 1906. Now, probably some other uh, superintendents lived in this house, or the one below us. There were a couple of houses here for the management people. One of those superintendents was Thomas Leggett. And he was a very significant superintendent in the mill's history, so we're going to be talking about him a lot later. Now, uh, you might have heard that Theodore Hoover had a very successful younger brother. That's right, it was Herbert Hoover who went from being a famous mining engineer to um, going to work for some presidents and then becoming president himself after being elected in 1928. So he did come to visit his brother here in Bodie in 1905, took time out from his busy schedule. They had a great time uh, roaming all over the area and enjoying themselves. Now, back to, back to the stamp mill. Well, let's suppose that you're going to come to work at the standard stamp mill. One thing that's going to happen is they're going to require that you go to a change room. And what's a change room? Well, it's to protect against high grading. They have a tremendous problem in Bodie and other mining towns with high grading. That's stealing the high grade ore. Now, if you're a miner, you could go in, maybe take a little piece of rock out that had a lot of gold in it, maybe sneak it out, hide it somewhere. But at the mill, it's being ground up and separated. So people would try to seal the dust. They might try to put it under their fingernails, in their hair, in a hat band, maybe even the cuffs of their pants. There are all sorts of things they tried. And to combat this kind of thievery, the mines and mills had uh, change rooms. And some of them had showers. You'd be required to take a shower before going home. So you're making good money already. People didn't understand why you were stealing. It's $4 a day for a 10-hour shift, and you're going to work six days a week. And that's, that's a pretty uh, tough schedule. You'll be off on Sundays. And for most of the time here in Bodie, there were two churches, a Catholic and a Methodist, as you could attend. But there were also close to 65 saloons, and I have a feeling that's where a lot of these guys went when they got off work. Now we're going to head up the hill and talk a little bit more about how that ore gets into the mill for processing. So we're going to be heading right up that hill toward those tanks and that trestle. We've got a couple of water tanks up here on the hill. I know you thought they were hot tubs, but they're not. 
there for storing water that they pumped out of the mines. It looks very dry here in Bodie, but there was a very high groundwater table. So when they went down to the mines, they were hitting water at 400, 500 feet in some of the areas, and they had to constantly pump that out. And they would use the water here at the mill. Now, the mill that's before us now is the second mill on this site. The first one was built in 1877, and it was all wood. It burned completely to the ground. Four months after the fire in October 1898, they rebuilt the mill, and this is the one that was up and running by February 1899. And you see they made some changes. They put the galvanized steel siding on it, made it a little more fireproof, I would think. The mill originally ran on a steam engine, and to power that steam engine, they needed 20 cords of wood a day. And a cord of wood, just one cord, would be four by four by eight feet. And that, and look at it another way. It's like uh, 20 full-size pickup trucks driving up here every day with a load of wood in the bed of the truck piled up to the cab. So that's a lot of wood. Now, for a steam engine, you need wood and you need water. So you know they got the water, but where are they getting the wood? A lot of you look around here and say, oh, they, they chopped down all the trees. And actually, that's a lot of people have asked me over the years. But there never were any trees here. It all had to be brought in. Every stick of wood you see here came from somewhere else, from the Sierra Nevada and down near Mono Lake. They eventually built a railroad just to bring wood to town. The need was that great. Because remember, there used to be nine stamp mills here in total from about 1877 to 1881 over 150 stamps in this little valley. And you could hear it quite a ways away. You could hear it about three miles out with all of those stamp mills running. So imagine the need for wood. And with the winters here, people need wood to keep warm too. All right, we're gonna now talk about how you get the ore into the building. We're gonna walk over to this old bucket here and talk about the ore delivery system. Now, if you're here in 1877, there would have been wagons that brought the ore down, but boy, that, that was hard work and you couldn't do it in the winter. So the Standard, being a very forward-thinking company, um, put in an ore delivery system. It would have been big wooden towers going up, connected by a heavy metal cable with 50 of these iron buckets. And you can see that they unload from the bottom and they would unload into ore carts here and then be pushed into the top floor. Now, those of you who live in the San Francisco area, I'm sure you're familiar with the cable cars. The cable cars uh, were invented by a fellow named Andrew Halliday. And he did that in 1873, but before that, he was known in the mining camps for uh, Halliday's metal ropeway. So he was very well known for that before the cable cars ever came along. And it was a pretty efficient system because they could use it in winter. They could get ore down here year round. The mine was a little bit up this hill, about 2,500 feet away, and so that's where the buckets came down. And they could do 45 tons of ore down here in an eight-hour period. Pretty impressive. Now, why isn't it here anymore? Well, they discontinued it in 1890. Why? I have some guesses. I had a few problems with it. You see, the ore was so heavy, it was stretching the metal cable. At one point in 1879, they had to cut 23 feet out of it that was slack. And I imagine that kind of problem kept occurring. By 1896, the Standard is the major mine here, and they've bought a few other companies that are out of business. So now they own the Bodie Mine, another very successful mine in Bodie's history, and they've acquired a tunnel, a horizontal tunnel, one of the few horizontal entries into a mine. And it was down canyon, so it would meet up with the standards uh, shaft and whole array of tunnels there. So this was downhill. You could also get the water out that way. So they would hook up a mule to the ore carts, load up the ore carts, bring it out of the tunnel, along a track that used to be down here, to the ramp, which I think you can see the ramp on the side of the mill here. And They'd send the mule back for more. They would attach a 
hook to the ore cart and a winch would bring it right up here to the top floor. Now we're going to talk about what the ore, how the ore gets sized in a few minutes because I'm going to take you up to uh, the uh, very top of that right up there. But in the meantime, I want to show you the mortar boxes. So if we're going to walk right over here. All right, right in front of me are what we call mortar boxes. And you're going to see these inside all set up, but this is a great opportunity to see them up close. They're solid iron. Uh, they were made in San Francisco, California, where they had a lot of uh, foundries. And they weigh about three tons, so no one's going to walk away with these. So the mortar boxes were the casings for the stamps. Five stamps fit in a mortar box, and we call that a battery of stamps. Now, we're going to hear, hear more about this, but to get the ore in here, it has to be about fist size. And we're going to use all our water to push the ore under the stamps. The stamps will crush it. And inside, I'm going to show you a screen, and you'll see just how fine this is going to be crushed. Now we're going to move down the hill, get ready to go inside the mill. I'm also going to show you an entire stamp that we have sitting out there. Right in front of me on the ground is an entire stamp. So imagine this standing up, but we're going to start here from the bottom. And right here is the shoe or the foot of the stamp, this little narrow section. The big section here, that's the boss of the stamp, very heavy section. And then the long piece is the stem of the stamp. Now, on the stem of the stamp is this piece. It's called the tappet. And it would normally be on the stem, about three feet from the top. Now, this is tapered, so when you stand this up, it's not going to go sliding down. It will only go down to a certain point. And it is the tappet that's going to make this stamp move. I'm going to step right over here to this camshaft and talk a little more about this. We have an old camshaft out here, and this is probably the closest we're going to get to one, so I wanted to show it to you. So, you're standing in the mortar box. These are coming around this way, and the tappet is going to take a ride on this cam. And this will come around, but then you see the tappet will lose contact, and that's when the stamp crashes down and crushes the ore. And then another one comes around, and they're all going in an alternate fashion. And again, it's uh, up and down 90 times a minute. Boom, boom. It's going to be uh, very noisy. And uh, it's all going to be turned by a drive wheel with a belt on it. And we'll see some of these when we get inside. Everything in the mill is run on a series of belts and pulleys. Now, if you came to work here, you would have to be a union member. These were all union jobs. In case you were wondering, $4 a day for... 10 hours. That was an exceedingly high rate at that time. And there are a lot of dangers, and we're going to find out about those. Now we're going to go inside and see the support section of the mill before we go back to how the mill makes its journey down to the stamps. And we're going to enter the motor room and the machine shop. 